It turns out that New York's Democratic governor is hooked on something, and you'll be really surprised to find out what it is. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, what Kathy Hochul, the governor of New York State, is hooked on these days is phonics. She has just proposed that uh, the state spend $10 million to, and by the way, I'm getting this from the New York Times, so this isn't something from Fox News or something. The governor proposed spending $10 million to retrain teachers on what is known as, quote, the science of reading, which involves teaching children to sound out words, decode them, and understand their meaning, as well as helping them expand their vocabulary. She's called calling for increase in teacher training programs at state universities so we can prepare teachers to teach this obscure science of reading. And uh, Stephen Green, the reason why uh, she's doing this is because last year, fewer than half of New York State's third graders were proficient on state reading tests. Now, many teachers in New York City and the state have been trained and have been using a method known as balanced literacy, which encourages, and this is in the New York Times words, independent reading and includes practices that experts say are problematic, like teaching children to guess words using pictures. Uh, Experts and policymakers say it is now clear the balanced literacy, literacy approach did not offer children enough foundation in the fundamental skills such as phonics. Uh, Stephen Green, uh, this, I guess it's one of those things where if you wait long enough, uh, common sense will come back around again. But what do you make of this move by New York State's governor and the city, by the way, has done something comparable to invest millions of dollars basically to go back to the way that I was taught to read? Yeah. Uh, retrofitting is, is always more expensive than, than getting it right the first time. When, when Melissa and I bought this house, guys, almost 20 years ago now, it was 2006. Um, there were things we needed about it. There was a lot of space downstairs for a, for a studio because there was PJ TV and all that. And upstairs, there were enough bedrooms for the two kids we wanted to have and also for our, our drunk friends to pass out after a, after a night of dinner partying with them. Um, but there were also a lot of things we had to fix about it, and it took a lot of time and a lot of money, and this is what's going on in education. We're going to have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money to get back to where we were to begin with back when the American education, public education, was the envy of the world. And Bill has talked about this on previous episodes that I had no idea about this history of American education and how, you know, <coughs> you know Kings and queens used to come from Europe to marvel at our schools and try and take tips that they could bring back to their own countries. Um, it, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that we, we've pissed away. And really what I blame is bureaucracy, whether it's these, these huge unified school districts like you have in Los Angeles, the state departments of education in all 50 states that are just huge and bloated, and of course the federal department of education, which never should have existed and has been instrumental since its creation in the 1970s in destroying American public education. And the reason is, Scott, bureaucrats have to justify their sad, useless existence. And, and the way they do that is by taking something that works and saying, hmm, that's a pretty tasty soup. I should pee in it. And this, <laughs> this is the entire justification for their jobs is to take taxpayer money and change things that have worked for a very long time because otherwise they don't have any reason to be their budgets are meaningless and and need to be zeroed out scott these uh, the department of education needs to go uh state level education departments whatever they're called need to go these unified school districts need to go schools need to be run as direct and locally as humanly possible um, get rid of the bureaucracy get rid of the layers I've talked about this before if you look at at spending per pupil it, it's actually been about the same it, the money that actually goes into the classroom and yet we spend more and more on education and it all goes to administrators who've got to pee in the soup same thing with medicine um, the, the number of doctors Per, per patient has remained relatively steady over the last 50, 60 years, but spending has skyrocketed 
and so much of it is on administration, on Medicare, on Medicaid, on bureaucrats who got to pee in the soup. Fire them all, zero out their departments, and uh, the next person who proposes that we do this stuff again say, oh, hey, you know, we got rid of that thing, but uh, maybe we should bring it back. Just shoot them. Just, <laughs> just shoot them. You know, Bill Whittle, uh, certainly balanced literacy sounds more sophisticated than phonics, uh, which seems kind of like a blunt instrument. Um, and I don't want to be the person who stands up and, and says there's no opportunity for innovation in the way we teach or, or the way students learn in the school system. Um, so how do you how do you balance that idea where you say, yes, we want to constantly be learning and growing um, so that we get better at doing what we're doing, but we don't want to throw the baby out with the proverbial uh, bathwater? Um, is it just that you have to do what Kathy Hochul is doing now, which is basically rechristening uh, phonics as the science of reading and telling everybody that we now have to follow the science? Well, first of all, that's the entire uh, progressive uh, history in a nutshell. We tr try a policy, have disastrous results, rename it, and try it again. Um, balanced literacy, to me, sounds like, well, we're going to strike a balance between a really good way to educate people and a really bad way to educate people. We're going to strike a balance between these two things. right? Now, I'm one of these guys that thinks that, you know, just outside the box thinking, maybe literacy shouldn't be balanced. Maybe literacy should be should be excellent. Maybe you should stick 100% of the way that works and leave the way that doesn't work out completely. I know that's exclusive and 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 all the rest of that thing, but yeah, that's that's so that's that's the first thing. Um, the, for for many, first of all, a quick moment of silence for the two generations we've lost mm. as a result of this of this insanity. The, the teaching methods that they went to to replace phonics was, I think it was called um, see and say. Here's the word giraffe, and here's a picture of a giraffe. Memorize these hieroglyphics <laughs> in this order, because that's what a giraffe is. I'm not kidding. I'm yeah. not kidding at all. And, and this, is, this, is the, 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 this is a much better way to teach people, they thought. And so if you see a picture of, of, uh, of a Stephalophagus or, or, or uh, you know, something that people haven't seen, you can't describe it because you don't have the picture word connection. And the picture word connection is very weak. Every single time you've seen a movie about people coming up from nowhere, there's a scene where the person is learning to read and they're going fa 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 father father and 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 so we're the first society in the history of the world that was smart enough to destroy the entire concept of language because that's what language is language is a, is a series of, of 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 letters that produce a certain sound so that when they're struck together in a certain way by by making each one of the individual sounds you come up with the word that's how language works that's old-fashioned and 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 the results are are you know in front of us so by weird coincidence, sometimes these shows are just very strangely coincident. This morning, as I was getting ready, I was I, I had stuck in my head for for reasons that I'll, I'm sure my psychiatrist will explain to me. I had um, I had the song "Supercalifragilistic Expialidocious" in my head. It just was, and I thought I could spell that. I could absolutely I could spell that right now. The most the longest word that I've ever encountered that was a serious word was anti-disestablishmentarianism. And I could spell that word too. Um, and so, so you're not just talking about people's ability to speak. You're really talking about their ability for their language to reflect what is, what is it, for their language to reflect a thought. If you if you're not capable of putting together something that's completely new, then then you you can't think of it. Like supercalifragilistic expialidocious, for example. The whole thing is, as Steve said, um, the result of people trying to fix things that aren't broken. You notice I didn't say ain't broken. Uh, <laughs> and and. Trying to fix things that aren't broken and put their fingerprints on it. I saw this. Ex I, I saw this when I was an editor in Hollywood, where they would have these mid-level executives that would come in for note sessions, and they all had to have some notes. And pretty much universally, they were terrible, just awful. But 
you got to put them in because this person's making two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to you know to to go and give their creative input on these things. These are the kind of people that would have said to Steven Spielberg, you know, what would make this this um, uh, this incredible movie of yours better? You know, I, I I just I just think it would be so much better um, if if you were to uh, just stay with me on this, Stephen. What if what if Schindler had a talking dog? Okay, and uh, th th this kind of mind. So yes, all of it is a tragedy. Now, also some of it, even when we were teaching language, uh, well, when I was in fifth grade, sixth grade, I came over here from Bermuda, we got into sentence diagramming and we never diagrammed a sentence in English school and our grammar was perfect. Um, I'll give you a quick example. You know, a lot of people have problems with the I, me thing, you know? So it's like uh, somebody invited Helen and I to the to the uh, to the movies, or should it be Helen and me to the movies, and our English teacher said, "Well, this is very simple. Yep. The, the, the person invited Helen and me to the movies. Take the Helen out, and what do you have? The person invited me to the movies, not the person invited I to the movies. Use that every time you have any kind of question, and, and it's solved. And, I, and and it's solved for life now. And if you are watching the show, it's solved for your life too. So, it's not so hard. It's just." Another example of of the progressive idea that change by definition is good, that any kind of change is what progressive means today, is that anything that changes the existing order has to be better. And uh, it ain't necessarily so. You know, in the morning, the first thing I do um, after I crank up the coffee is I, I sit down with uh, my Bible, and uh, currently I've been spending a little over a year going through a study of the Book of Romans, and I often refer, while I'm doing this, I'm, I'm writing out this study for myself, and while I'm doing this, I often refer to what's called an interlinear Bible, where they basically take the original Greek and they uh, interlace it with the modern English translations so that you can see um, what those words were. And and I have been amazed as I go through the this old Greek text to discover um, how many words the ancient Greeks have stolen from us. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> they have just, just, in some cases, wholesale <laughs> copied entire words out of uh, our modern English language. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when my youngest son uh, was very young, I remember uh, after dinner going into the living room and sitting down in a chair, and, and he would hop up on my lap. And uh, the way I taught him to read uh, was we literally opened John's Gospel in the New Testament. And at first, I would read it to him and then ask him to watch the words and repeat it back to me. Um, but then after a while, he was doing all the reading, and it didn't take very long for this to happen. Um, and it was amazing how quickly, just doing this night after night, he was able to work his way through the entire um, first chapter of John so that he could read it, not memorize it, but read it. And um, and I realized years later, I thought, you know, the so-called science of reading here came down to a simple thing that I said to him over and over and over again, and you know what it is. Sound it out. Because there is a simple concept that he could grasp. Yes. You don't need a balanced literacy. You don't need this whole superstructure of educational mumbo jumbo. You need something simple enough for a small child to understand, which is sound it out. Do do some vowels make different sounds in different circumstances in the English language? They most certainly do. Is English a very complicated language to that extent? Yes, it is. Um, however, I found that even a little child reading something very basic, and if you read John's Gospel, you will find that uh, almost all the words are single-syllable words at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <laughs> um, you know, it's just beginning is the biggest word there. And so you start off with a text like that, and you just say, sound it out. Now, this is not the science of reading. This is the common sense of reading. 
If science wants to jump on board with common sense, they are always welcome to join us. Uh, but I will say what I often say um, in situations like this, um, and I will praise Governor Kathy Hochul for doing this, for changing the emphasis in New York's uh, school systems toward more focus on the so-called science of reading, because she's headed in the right direction. Have they made mistakes in the past? Yes, they have. Should they be beaten up for those mistakes? We have already done a lot of beating. <laughs> and do we, what do we want to do now? We want to encourage them to keep moving in the direction of common sense and of science, which happen to go hand in hand, as they usually do. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.